All right, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, we are still waiting for a few more people to join, but we might just get started. Um, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first instalment of our four-part Wormwise webinar series. So we'll be covering all things worm management in shape um, and organised by the Northern Tablelands Local Land Services. My name is Brianna Carney and I'm a local land services officer based out of Armadale, but servicing the entire Northern Tablelands region. And joining us for this series is our presenter, Dr. Nigel Brown, who is a former district veterinarian uh, for the Northern Tablelands based out of Glen Innes. Many of you may have met Nigel um, in the past and you know that he comes with a wealth of knowledge, particularly when it comes to worm management. So welcome, Nigel. Just some housekeeping before we kick off. Um, by default, Teams will have your microphone and video off, so you should hear us, but we won't be able to hear you. There is a Q&A icon in the top um, banner of Teams. Um, so if you have any questions, please pop them in there and hopefully we'll have some time to address them um, toward the end of the session. The webinar is also being recorded, so it should be available to you within the coming days. Um, so without further ado, please welcome um, Nigel Brown, who will be presenting on the fundamentals of integrated worm management this evening. So over to you, Nigel. Thank you very much indeed, Brianna. Nice to be here. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, as they might say. Um, I've got um, a very enjoyable uh, topic tonight to talk to the, uh, about worms. And, and they've asked me to talk about four different topics over the next four, four uh, nights that we're talking about. So tonight is integrated management, which is really the biggest one of the lot. Um, and then we're going to be talking about managing barber's pole worm, managing for scour worm and managing for liver fluke. And, and those really, those three encompass the, the, the major signs, I suppose, that you can expect to see with our gut parasites. Um, and that's sudden death caused by some, scouring, diarrhea, squitters, call it what you will, and, and weight loss and ill thrift. There's obviously uh, a merge between these different signs in different sorts of outbreaks, but that's the way we're going to go forward. So uh, without more ado, let's just move on to the 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 essence and, and, and look at what worm control was like yesterday. So when I was a little boy um, and, and that was, if I can put it very tritely, select a chemical that kills the worms, use it as often as you possibly can, use it at predetermined times, drench and move the sheep. And, and that map that we've got there shows the different types of of worm uh, control programs that were written sort of 15, 20, 25 years ago to cover the, the parts of New South Wales. I, I nowadays tend to think of that as painting by numbers because it resulted in drench resistance, uh, ineffective worm kill and increased losses from worms because we hadn't learned as much as we thought we had about, about fighting against worms. So some clever individual went back and looked in history about the, the, the fighting wars. And um, he came across this chap, Sun Tzu, uh, who, who in about 512 BC, so we're talking obviously a couple of thousand and a, a bit years ago, wrote this thing called The Art of War. Um, and it, it, it referred to understanding the weaknesses of your enemy, strategic planning, risk mitigation and adaptability to conditions. And I think that that's actually very apposite for what we're talking about now, which is um, when we're talking about sheep production. So what is your battlefield? What are the worms allies? And, and what are your, uh, your own allies when it comes to this battle, which is what it undoubtedly is against, against the worms. So having set it like that, worm control today, we need to use modern science and knowledge. Uh, it's not rocket science, um, it's pretty straightforward. 
we need to know the biology of the worms because they don't try to think. They just respond to the environment in which they're living. And if you understand their biology, you can find ways to overcome their weaknesses. You want to uh, have your worm control program actually think of it as part of your farm biosecurity plan. There isn't a one size fits all uh, properties, in my opinion. So you've got to work out the one that, that suits your time, your terrain uh, and so forth. And, and, and it may be totally different from the person next door. They will have a different mix of animals on their property, for instance. The big thing, as far as I'm concerned, and I'll keep coming back to this over the next four talks, is, is monitoring the worm state of flocks effectively. We, we're talking sheep, of course, uh, mainly, um, but whether it's goats or others, you want to monitor and know what worms and what numbers you've got there. We want to be increasing the natural resistance of animals to the worms. And there, we'll talk about those in the ways uh, in the days to come. We'll also need to be looking at grazing management. Again, that's going to vary by system, by season, and a whole raft of factors depending on what's going on. And that, again, is your property decision. You need to understand drenches, the days when there was a raft of drenches out there that you could use that would all work and, and you just use that all the time have long since gone. There used to be big debates as to whether you should be using the same drench for a season and then changing another season to another drench and then going back. But I think over the last 25 years, the verdict has come back that using single drenches is, is no longer going to work work out and it's going to increase uh, more rapidly the levels of resistance, uh, drench resistance that there are ongoing. So let's just look at the biology of, of worms. We're talking gut worms, the major gut worms here. And in essence, what's going to happen is that the sheep are going to be eating the grass, the worms are in their belly, and the dung is going to come out at the back end. You've then got your larvae, uh, well, the eggs are going to hatch into larvae, and those usually, depending on the temperature, will hatch in anything from four to ten days. A bit later on, we'll look at some of the temperatures that are needed for those. But once these larvae have been on the grass, we'll look at in the next slide at just where they are on the pasture. Once they get inside, it's what we call the infective larvae, the L3 that, that is eaten with the grass. That then settles in the intestine of the animals and then starts laying eggs. And essentially, the timing to remember is that first four to up to, say, 10 days for the hatching on the ground, depending on the species. But then it's going to be about 18 days from a larva that is eaten, laying its own, own eggs that are coming out in the feces. And that's a critical period because you've got to remember that when they start getting infected by, if you move to a paddock, new paddock, that's when it's going to start re and further contaminating. So if we look at where the larvae are on the pasture, this little diagram here shows that really uh, after or above about 15 centimetres, there's very, very little uh, larvae on the pasture. Most of it is in the top five centimetres or so. And of course, that is where the sheep are grazing. They're not that interested in the higher stuff. But this little black and white diagram shows that it's around the base of the grass, where the moisture is, etc. And the dew, that is where these little larvae like to, to live. They, like other living forms, require water, oxygen and the right sort of temperature. You get it too hot 
they don't like it. You get it too cold, they don't like it. They've got to have a certain amount of oxygen in there. So um, if you like, uh, it, it, in ordinary past, it's going to be a fair bit of oxygen around for them to breathe. But if you start putting in all the, the droppings into a midden, they're, they're actually going to sort of start, starve themselves of oxygen because they're going to compost away. So that's the essence of where they are. And and that is the critical one of the critical aspects, because if there's a thick sward of grass above that great ground level, it's going to protect the larvae from ultraviolets of sunlight. It's going to keep them warm. It's going to keep a moisture environment. If that grass is shorter, it allows it to dry out more rapidly. It allows the UV to get in. And that is going to actually kill off the various larvae much more rapidly. Now, just think of this diagram, this, this table here. Different worms, and here are the three major ones that we're going to be talking about, barber's pole, the brown stomach, and the black scour worm. Look at the daily egg production of those in the next column. Big, big difference between them. 10,000 eggs per day from a barber's pole but a mere 50 to 100 of the brown stomach or 100 to 200 of the black scour, right? Look at the ideal temperatures for hatching, right? 18, 8, greater than 18, um, and the moisture levels that are required. And look at how long those eggs will survive, even in good ideal conditions. All of those will very much influence the survival of the larvae that are on that pasture and how many of those uh, various eggs will actually hatch. Let's look at this next couple of points here. So the survival rate of these larvae, um, or these eggs hatching out to the L3, remember that's the bit, the, the larval stage that goes into the body. We're talking here about 27 to 50 percent at that sort of temperature range when the humidity is reasonably good at 60 percent. That means, and I was listening to, to Matt several times over the last year talking uh, about this thing, is that they've done calculations where the daily larval intake could be 20,000 larvae per kilogram dry, dry matter in the food that they're taking in. And that's not an extreme level. He's recorded them 40, up to 50,000 uh, larvae per kilogram. That's a lot of infectious material to go into these animals and if we if we look at this way way forward there's that little comment there that maybe gives you a different slightly different perspective as well just a quick diagram here to show which area we are we're in this is based on the the rainfall patterns so if you're reading material just be careful that the material that you're reading off different websites from from google or whatever relate to the area in which you are because the worms behave differently in response to the weather round and about. So Victoria is different from parts of WA or different from parts of Queensland. Just be very careful with that. Now, here's a quick I, couple of maps which I took off the uh, BOM site the other day, basically indicating that this season coming up is going to be hotter and wetter than average both of which are going to be conditions that our worms, especially our barber's pole, but uh, the, the, bar, the worms are going to really love. So we can anticipate that the, let's say the weather's not in our favour at the moment. Okay. Um, now, 
we talked about the survival. I just did want to give you this little diagram here because so many people turn around and think that spelling a paddock for a week is going to be good enough to kill off larvae because they've read that they don't last very long. Look at those temperatures. So if it's if it's cold, uh, less than five degrees, uh, they can be expected to last for, for four months. When it gets hot, they can, so 22, 35, they can still last for one and a half months. And the little diagram on the left is for the technically minded to show that there is a bit of variation. It's not a straight line decay. That little diagram or photo, I should say, in the bottom corner is actually a drop of dew showing little L3 larvae uh, on the grass. And you can imagine that if the larvae are in that dew, as that dew evaporates, some of those larvae are going to die if they're not eaten. Larvae are wriggling all the time. So if the temperature is hotter, that warms them up. The larvae are more active. They're wriggling like mad. They will burn up their own energy because these larvae do not feed when they're on the ground. They're just using up what was given to them in the egg. So uh, if they burn up the energy, they won't last so long. But if it's cooler, they're wriggling less because their metabolism isn't running at full tilt. And that means they will survive longer. And hence, that's one of the factors involved with their, their survival uh, on the grass. So what's effective worm management monitoring? I've got several points here which I like to think of, of, of being important. And, and I actually think that most of these can and should be done by producers themselves. But clinical examination is, is a, a, a prime example. What are you looking for? Now, where I put FAMA chart, that's a colour chart um, which was developed, which shows the pinkness around the eye. We've all seen and looked at eyes to see whether they're pale or white, but this actually graduates that. I'll come on to that a bit in the next star, in the next slide. The consistency of the faeces obviously could be diarrhoea, but not all worms cause diarrhoea. Barber's pole don't cause diarrhea. So you're going to be looking at the dags at the backside. You should be really looking at the weight of the animal and not just guessing it, but actually, I believe, weighing them, because that also comes back to using the drenches. And I'm also a great believer that using a body condition score actually is is as much use as as weight when used in combination, because um, it shows you their muscle, the fat levels that are there. And, and last but not least, uh, I use postmortems, and I think producers can. I encourage you all, if you've got a deb sheet, get the most that you can from it by opening it up and having a little look. And if it's only freshly dead, you could even find, for instance, barber's pole worms inside. But uh, you have to be there within only a few hours because they sort of disintegrate quite soon after death. Then there's the routine use of faecal egg counts. Now, you can send those off to the lab and they will do it. But there is a delay. I, for many years, have taught people to do their own worm egg counts, which in conjunction with what they send off to their lab for typing, etc., of different worms and worm eggs, um, is a very, very useful technique. It puts you right in the heart of your own control mechanism because you can collect the sample, come into the, to the workshop or kitchen or wherever it is that you're doing your egg counting um, and get a result very, very quickly and then go out and either let them back into the paddock or drench them. It's as simple as that. So you do need to know what worms are present. You can't tell by looking at the eggs whether it's a, it's a uh, barber's pole or a black scour worm using some of those other signs you can tell but you also it's much better to get a representative um, um 
count so that you know what percentage are of which species um, and, and that is is very valuable and it's not something that most people can do by themselves as i've said most infections are a mixture of different words and drench check when you've drenched if you're doing your own counts especially you can check exactly 14 days later after you've drenched whether you've got any eggs there or not you should not have any eggs but if you've got drench resistance then you will have and that's how you check not 10 days not 18 days 14 days afterwards every three years you probably want to do a drench test which is to see which drenches are working drench resistance comes very very quickly and you need to know where you stand otherwise you're going to have a major breakdown here on the left of this next skill is the famichar chart or a four version of it which shows the pinkness it gives an indication of the um the number the pack cell volume which in a normal sheep should be about 27 to 45 percent but if you look down at these very horrible white pale ones they have got very very few blood cells in them it's the blood cells that can carry the oxygen and that's why these animals are tired from the barber's pole disease because they've got no oxygen carrying capacity to help them ha have any energy i put the knife in to remind people for post-mortems you've all seen killers seen how healthy they are take it the next step and look at the unhealthy ones and probably most of you are already uh, doing condition scoring of one sort or another so i'm a great believer that if you've got decent conditioned animals then their resistance to the effects of worms is greater and here, here's a chart not pulled together by me but basically indicating that the better conditioned animals are much less likely to be suffering production losses and also a rising plane of nutrition will increase their resilience so that's their ability to throw off the effect or resist the, the negative effects of parasites and we'll talk about what those are for specific worms uh, in in future chats so resistance and resilience there's natural resistance here uh, is genetic but we can increase that by selecting for rams young are much less resistant than old so lambs less than weaners or weathers the nutritional if their nutritional state is good their resistance will be high and i bring your attention to selenium there because that is a mineral that is used in forming antibodies and there is vaccines which are only available at this juncture against the barber's pole worm grazing management so we we talk about all these gaps we've we've looked at some of the factors which influence the cover and the protection of the worms and the larvae that are there grazing different species using hay and silage and and cropping are good ways to clean pastures up we talked about drench resistance so a good drench that effective drench should kill 95 percent or more of the worms but if we look at the bottom of this we can see that zolvix which was released in new zealand in 2009 the first resistant cases appeared in 2013 so it didn't take them very long and that's brought about by sublethal doses of the active ingredient so it doesn't kill the worms they survive and genetically the ones that have survived lead us on into having resistance because those are the ones that live on on and can put their eggs back onto the ground and it's been brought about essentially by repeated use of the same active ingredients so we need to improve the management we need to reduce the reliance on antelmintics and we must 
as far as possible avoid bringing resistant worms onto our properties even if it's only one or two rams we need to uh, make certain that we're doing and nowadays what we need to use is combination drenches with have got three or four active ingredients at the time and that old comment there about the most expensive drench is the one that doesn't work is just so true but none of these drenches get cheaper here's the different groups i'm not can't cover all those in the next three or four minutes that's when you need to be looking up but just remember that the active ingredient is not the same as the trade name. It's the smaller writing which tells you which group of drug is in the mixture. So you know your worm egg count before you start. You know the weight of your sheep so that you can get them accurately. There are now systems there which, which electronically weigh the sheep and send that information to the dredge gun so that it's giving the right amount of drench. Make certain your equipment is working properly and calibrated. And again, as we've said, choose the right drench. And I suppose that that's it technically, but the question comes, when do you move to a clean paddock? Remember, it's gonna take two or three days for the drench and the worms that are in the system to come out. So if, the, if there are live eggs in there, in the first three days, they could be pumped out onto the grass to hatch normally. So you actually want to th be thinking about where do you put the sheep in the first two or three days after drenching so you're not immediately contaminating your paddock. We're just getting to the end of the time here. So that quarantine drench that I mentioned is, is going to be uh, critical so that you're not uh, bringing those in. But again, even if you, they treat them as they put them on the truck, you isolate them for three or four days somewhere where no sheep are going so that they're not going to be contaminating your own environment. Um, there are some recommendations that still that Zolvix and other unrelated drenches are good, but get up to date advice from professionals. Your take home message is then don't just rely on drenches. Don't guess. Use modern science and modern knowledge. Learn about parasites, the disease and the control mechanisms that suit you. Link with professional services, test feces routinely. And as I've said, you can do this your own science with egg counting and programs that you can do yourself, clinical examinations of individual sheep and using the postmortem. When I worked out at uh, Glen Innes at the field station, we used to get young students from the school, high school come through and I taught a couple of them to be really good at doing the egg counting for the station. Really made so much difference. Um, they haven't gone on to be uh, rocket scientists, um, but they can count worm eggs and I'm sure you could too. And I put in there in the little heart, um, Parabos, so that you can find, if you don't already know it, a good source of, of information. But, um, or, Please, if you've got any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody might have. But don't forget your LLS people who can tell you or tell you who to talk to if you've got any problems. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much, Nigel. Again, if you have any questions, please pop them in that Q&A tile at the top. We are quickly running out of time, um, but Nigel, I did have one question. It's something that I get asked quite frequently. If someone's done a drench resistance test recently and efficacy falls below 95% for most of those chemical actives, what are their options? As in, will, chem will combination drenching still be effective or do they still need to have at least one active that has a high efficacy in that combination drench? Thank you. Yes, that's... I I mean, it's no bad question, but that one is a really interesting. There seems to be a mechanism whereby 
if you've got several different drenches that are themselves all not as efficient as they once were, they do work together to raise the overall effectiveness. And that's why these, excuse me, these new combination drenches work well. But without wishing to name names, there are there are I, I still meet people who, who use two different Amazon based drenches, clear drenches, and think that that's going to be a good combination because the active ingredient is the, basically the same. It doesn't give that same complementary beneficial effect. And what about the difference between how they're administered? So the difference between porons versus injectables or oral drenches. Is there a difference in effectiveness in that regard? No, there seems not. The testing that's, that the pharmaceutical companies do um, basically are all the, these drenches now. They they don't mean that the the worms are swimming and drown in the drench. It, it's it's in the the components that they ingest from the animal from the blood what have you but it's the uh, adequacy of the technique so if they're going to be spitting out half of the drench because you've got a, a be awful technique and and th then they're not going to be getting the right dose if you're applying something on the skin and, and a lot of it runs off they're not going to be getting the dose. So it is a question of making certain that you know it much more accurately than people often do um, what the weight of the animal is to give the calculated dose and make certain it gets into or onto the animal. Yeah, well, that brings us to the end of our time. Um, so I'd just like to thank everyone who joined us this evening. Um, Oh, hang on, we did have, no, all good. <laughs> um, mm. So a big thank you to everyone for joining and a big thank you to you, Nigel, um, for presenting tonight. Um, I'm sure you've all got a lot out of tonight's presentation and if you'd like any further information, please don't hesitate to get in touch with myself or simply just call up one of our LLS officers. We can put you in contact with anyone um, you need, any of our district vets. Um, also, please don't forget tomorrow's session at 6 p.m. on Barber's Pole Worm. It's a very significant worm in our region, especially going into spring. So if you haven't registered yet, please get in and do so. Um, and, of course, the two other webinars the following week on scour worms and liver fluke. So thanks, everyone, and we'll see you at the next session. Thank you. See Enjoyed you. it. Bye. Bye.